Okay, cool. So uh, to try and save time and get a bit more stuff out into the videos, uh, what we'll do, like I say, we'll go through the um, summons uh, reply. So once you've got the uh, gone through the notices, the caution notices updated, that's there. And so today we'll go through the updated uh, summons. So um, it's 10 pages, so it is pretty long, but uh, it's a template and people really need to understand uh, what a uh, template is. Okay, and a template is just that. It's uh, um, a something that we can rely on now. What am I sharing? Uh, what am I sharing? Okay, so hopefully people can see the document. <clears throat> and it starts off in the same format. And so your name, your address, the court's name. Now, this goes to the court as well as to the council. This should be copy, copy to the council. And the whole council thing. Um, so it's a, com now, it, it, um, apparently you can't, they they call it you're making a, a new complaint, okay? So we're complaining that the summons is a problem. Uh, just, okay. So basically, and it's a complaint under Magistrates Court Act 1981, Section 51, in respect of the purported court summons, their reference stated, blah, blah, blah. So, which, uh, under my common law right, I challenge the jurisdiction of this court on grounds the attached purported summons is void ab initio, and until dealt with, the court cannot proceed to trial. So then it goes into what is the purpose of the summons. Uh, can I make this bigger? Mark, can I just interrupt just here? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that is provided they don't change their, their ways between now and next year's um, summons? Uh, yeah, basically, as they change, and again, like I say here, the idea of a template is you need to modify it for the way things are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, your individual case. Okay. So it starts off with what is the purpose of the summons? Basically, it's to provide lawful authority for a court, i.e. the public. Public. Okay, to breach another's peace once a judicial officer who is bound under the oath is satisfied, uh, the complainant has lawful excuse. So th the reason for the summons and it being evaluated by a magistrate is because you're being called into a public venue and therefore it needs to be somebody that's applying their mind to breach your peace. So it all stems from a breach of peace. Then it's got the summons, and basically the summons, as you'll see, is actually a contract. So firstly, the summons does not identify the decision maker who issued it. The open justice principle requires the name of the person making a decision is well covered in Felix de Justices. Now, I've put in a couple of sections so that you can see more the context of the conclusion that there is no such thing as an anonymous JP. So the history of it was basically they started uh, putting in uh, <clears throat> they started putting in uh, um, uh, their own rules, okay, and you'll see how this is still happening uh, to remove the justices' names at that time, okay, and. Um, <clears throat> and that they're basically, you know, uh, introducing something into the uh, realm of public justice previously unheard of is the anonymity of who's making the decision. 
And then it quotes from Lord Diplock in 1979, okay? What he says basically is, prima facie, the interest of justice is served by its being administered in the full light of publicity. As a general rule, the English system of administration of justice does not does require that it is it be done in public. Okay, and then that comes from basically a 1913 case. If the way that courts behave cannot be hidden uh, from public ear and eye, this provides a safeguard against judicial arbitrariness and idiosyncrasy and maintains the public confidence in the administration of justice, i.e. totally the open justice principle. That's why we have public access to courts and we need to uh, see them. <clears throat> then it goes on, basically, the office of justice of peace is an ancient, honourable and indispensable to the needs of maintaining law and order and doing justice generally. A justice of the peace is a known person. Every justice using his or her name swears an, on appointment and oath of allegiance and judicial oath. And that's how the conclusion is reached in there. Okay. So uh, the conclusion is I would regard and I believe the general public likewise would regard a policy such as that maintained by Felix Doe justices and their clerk to be inimical, in, inimical uh, to the proper administration of justice and an unwarrant and unlawful obstruction to the right to know who sits in judgment. There is, in my view, no such person known to the law as an anonymous JP. And he, in, in the next paragraph, it starts like this. I do not for one moment suggest that the right to know uh, involves the disclosure of any more than the name of a justice. Okay. So uh, that is basically uh, where that comes in. And then what I've got is uh, this lovely lady that we all know. Okay. So where the source of this confusion has been traced back to Sean Jones. And then I put in because basically this year is to highlight uh, the conflicts of interest she has. Okay. <clears throat> because fundamentally, uh, from the JCS matters, it's clear that she is controlling or attempting to influence uh, the judicial decisions, uh, especially through the uh, being the secretary of the justices, legal advisors and court office service, which used to be the clerk of the uh, court society a professional society of lawyers who advise magistrates, a supposedly independent body dissolved in 2011, and the way that she's doing it, she's secretary of JCS matters. So in volume four, November 22, she explains how in 2010, the requirement for wetting signature was removed from the criminal procedure rules. Now, this here is what... Uh, I, I really uh, believe is a major, major, major problem. So in 2010, they removed from the criminal procedure rules the requirement for wetting signature. And it's presumably a delayed implementation of the re law reasoned in Brentford in 1975, which removed the requirement for wetting signature some 35 years earlier. So... That's the only rational reason that the criminal procedures would have been updated. Uh, however, it took 35 years for the regulations or the rules to catch up with the law, which is created in the court. And then it took four, another nine years before it went into the um, civil procedures. Now, Sean says... And and this here, if I just show you, well, I'll just show you so you can see for yourself. Um, she says, in desperation, when I drafted the 2019 amendment rules, I added a summons need not bear the name of the justice issuing it in the hope that would get the message home. 
So what was the message she was trying to get home? We don't need wetting signatures. So basically, this is irrational as there's no connection that removal, uh, removing the need of names would resolve the wet end signature problem. Okay? Totally irrational to remove the names. And then the 2019 rules also include or other person in the... So basically, a summons need not bear the name of the justice or other person issuing it. So somebody else put that in. I don't know. Sean uh, hasn't admitted to that. <clears throat> so subsequently, uh, Sean now admits in the recent High Court decision confirms there is no right to withhold the name of the justices and others who make or are involved in making judicial uh, signatures, um, I mean, uh, decisions including legal advisors. Again, this comes from uh, the magazine, uh, Justices, Clark Society, Matters, Volume 5, blah, blah, June 23. So this year was uh, six months after this one. Okay. So in that one, it says, further rule uh, 66B of the magistrate court rule requires the names of any person may, who made a decision to be provided by what, whoever asks. That's exactly what we are putting in, it's under Rule 66B that the public have access to the court uh, record. She continues uh, in her uh, commentary on that, uh, quoting, she acknowledged that the role of the legal advisor was different as they are not a member of the judiciary, but she, the judge of this High Court case, um, Concluded, a lay bench cannot make a decision unless a legal advisor exercises their functions. As such, the legal advisor is an integral and legally required part of the decision-making process. As such, it appears to me uh, to be right that their names can, in principle, be placed in the public dominion, i.e. reaffirming uh, uh, what was in 1975. And then Sean herself puts in a conclusion, the inevitable consequences of the integral part of the legal advisors plays in the decisions of the judiciary is that their role equally require public accountability and openness. Okay, so if I just uh, check out the uh, actual um, uh, Justice of the Clark matters, uh, oops. Okay. Uh, that should be hell. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the uh, December, November, December 22. And here she is where she says basically what I've summarized. And here she says, in desperation, when I drafted the amendment, in the hope that it'll get the message home. Okay. What's interesting is, it hasn't entirely, as recently as this year, a legal advisor told magistrate to dismiss an entire list of railway summonses because they weren't signed. The prosecutor had to reapply for the summonses to be issued and post them all over again, uh, to the bemused defendants. And of course, we look like twits. And here, she basically is uh, saying, because she obviously starts with this nonsense, uh, I spend a lot of time dealing with freemen of the land, pseudo lawyers, people with a different view of the law and the like. Okay. And she concludes... It's a sobering thought that we can all act like freemen of the land sometimes. Interesting little uh, way to finish that one. Okay, then the other one was the June one. Uh, where's the June one? Uh, June, July 23, so this one. So again, this year's uh, at the front uh, in the front page, the opening note from Sean, 
so that people can see what she looks like. Good old Sean Jones, she's really uh, doing a nice job there at the JCS. Okay, so here she affirms Rule 66B uh, authorizes the name to be known. And here then she talks about the High Court judge. Unfortunately, we haven't got access to the link. Uh, and this here confirms that uh, of what she said, it must be, uh, you know, it's right that it's in the public domain. And there, Sean agrees that it's about public accountability and openness. Therefore, when they denying us the right to uh, see, uh, get the legal advisors' names in a hearing, uh, they is uh, this is our authority that they must provide their names. Okay, so this is not only in regards to summons, but also in regards to court hearings. Not only must the magistrates give their names, the legal advisors also have to give their names. And you can quote Sean Jones, and she's your authority. But the details are here in what we've done. And it's not uh, that they give the names afterwards because you have the right to know who is making judgment against you. Okay. <clears throat> it continues then, Section 1481 of the um, Magistrate Court Act defines, in this act, the expression magistrate court means any justice or justices of the peace acting under any enactment by virtue of his or their commission or under the common law. Okay. Yeah. So all decisions of a court must bear the name of the person who is acting as a court. Okay, so uh, having their, you know, Liverpool Magistrates Court, that is not a court, because a court is the acting, i.e. the application of the judicial mind. And uh, so that uh, is an important point which people need to distinguish. Okay, so Sean's admission hence returns the name of the person issuing any decision of the court which affects another that the summons requires the name of the person who is responsible for issuing it without a name that has not come from a court they have to have a name on it and the court orders have to have a name on it otherwise it's not coming from a court and um, and so uh, again, re-emphasizing it's an unwarranted and unlawful obstruction to the right to know who sits in judgment. Again, no such thing as anonymous JP. So let us hope it doesn't take another 35 years to update the legal advisors and judicial officers. Without a name on the summons, uh, sorry, without a name, a summons is not a court document as the, a court is only when the justices sit not the location where they sit. Hence, void ab initio, no effect in law, and the court has no subject matter jurisdiction and cannot proceed to trial. Now, you'll see this. Uh, uh, this is very old law, uh, which uh, is the basis and foundation uh, to get us here. Right, then secondly, delegation of judith judicial authority is a recent concept experimented with from 1949 to 1952 I, for three years before it was reversed and again 1968 to 79 11 years and then it was reversed again in 79 only a justice of peace can issue a summons under the common law which is affirmed by parliament in section 51 of the magistrates court act uh, and affirmed in Regulation 34 of the Council Tax Admin Enforcement Regulation that complaint must be made to a Justice of the Peace. And the Magistrates Court functions rule uh, functions of authorised person civil proceeding rules are in breach of the primary legislation from which it claims its authority, and hence is void uh, uh, where delegate where those rules delegate any judicial function which must be under binding oath 
which forms a contractual relationship with each person who appears before the judicial officer. Why? Because of their oath, I will do right to all manner of people. And if I'm before the judge, that is a contract with me. It's called a unilateral contract. Um, so, um, I mean, we're not delving into here about Sean being actually a trained lawyer and barrister. But the important point with that is if it takes 35 years for the secondary reg regulations to catch up with the law, okay, this is why nobody knows what is going on there because there are so many conflicting things and nobody is sorting this out. And like I say, with computer technology now, we can start to sort all of this out on a fundamental level. Um, okay, so the third reason uh, that the summons is void is basically there is no precedent which allows for a judicial authority to be delegated because they're bound by the oath to law uh, and non-judicial officers are not bound to act under law. Okay, then we go through the case of proclamation 1610 was resolved that the law of England from three sources, custom, which is unwritten law, the common law, which is reason precedent, and statute law, which is act of parliament, which constrain royal prerogative in accordance with the Bill of Rights 1688. Now they are throwing at us that it's uh, ancient and stuff like that. So I just want to show you something. Uh, again, from uh, Justices of the Clark Society. Uh, if I can find it, if it's on these two. Uh, I was pretty sure it was in one of these two. Uh, where it's Freeman of the Land Watch, because they put the Bill of Rights in Freeman of the Land. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. Okay, so let me just share this other screen. And hopefully it'll explain to you why I've now put in last updated by the Crown Act on against the Bill of Rights 1688. So uh, if I just stop sharing that one and go to share this one. And I want to do a detailed thing with all of these just to show people exactly what's going on with this Don Justice's Clark Society. So this is their free man of the land watch. And guess what? Freemen of the landers are terrorists. Okay. But in the Bill of Rights, specifically, I referred to the Bill of Rights arguments in Freemen of the Land, Watch 26. And we'll go through all of these in a separate session. It continues to be cited, blah de blah de blah And then she said, the preamble of the Bill of Rights is still good law. Only the preamble. It is, however, a statement of general principle rather than a specific statute creating powers, duties and rights. Yet, it has been updated in 2013. And this is the nonsense that's being put into the magistrates' courts. This is the nonsense that the, um, the, the legal advisors who are supposed to be advising the magistrates, the lay magistrates on law, they get rubbish like this. It's insane what's going on. But that the, I want to deal with separately because there are so many places like this where that's going on so that the public can actually see how we do not have an independent judiciary. Anyway... So, uh, and hence uh, is current and relevant. 2013, that's 10 years, 11 years ago. Okay, Articles 1 and 2 for the purpose expressed in the first promise of the Coronation Oath Act 1688. That was last updated in the Statute Law Re uh, Revision Act 1948. Hence is current and relevant. It's not old, ancient or archaic. This has been updated recently. You know, within most most of our lifetimes. So 
where they come up with this nonsense about ancient and irrelevant, and that is just insane. Okay, and that there's to govern the people according to the people's respective laws and customs, which are affirmed as the birth, people's birthright in the Act of Settlement. The Act of Settlement also was updated in 2013 and hence is current and relevant. If it wasn't, and if it was, as they claim, okay, ancient and irrelevant, then they would have got rid of it uh, when they updated it, okay? And then it was further agreed in the case of proclamation that royal prerogative derives its authority to govern from the law of the land, and law of the land was de uh, defined as the common law in the confirmation of the Charters 1297. That's what that was updated in 1971. Again, current and relevant. So this whole nonsense that they're using about, oh, it's irrelevant, it's ancient, it's uh, old, blah, 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 is utter nonsense. And, and that really we've got to get uh, more and more people to understand. The other thing is enactment is still royal prerogative. Why? It was not constrained by Parliament in the Royal Assent Act 1967. Current, relevant, <clears throat> and therefore rationally affirmed statute law is still subject to the common law. Why? Because the common law uh, or the law of the land is subject to uh, common law. Royal prerogative is subject to common law. And that was resolved in 1610. Okay, further, <clears throat> under 16, uh, uh, section 148, justices have statutory or legislative duties uh, inherent by the commission, i.e. the judicial oath and common law duties. They are bound by the uh, uh, unanimous 11 judge Supreme Court case, uh, Boris Johnson's case, the prorogation case, which reaffirmed Antic and Carrington from 1765. So we've got a 2019 case reaffirming a 1765 case. Okay. And uh, so it's got nothing to do with how old the case is. It's whether it's reason precedent, current and relevant. Okay. And that there was reasoned that uh, agents of the state are unlawful when being without authority conferred by an act of parliament or the common law. Okay. Now remember, acts of parliament are subject to the common law. They derive their authority from the common law. And therefore, without common law authority, then it's uh, unlawful. And in there, it was... Uh, Lord Camden's dictum, if it is law, it will be found in our books. I.e., whenever they are claiming any authority, show me the book that you've got that from. Show me the Act of Parliament. Show me the case law. As opposed to what they're saying in the court, uh, if we look at what happened with uh, my case, um, it was the barrister's opinion that a... a a demand notice and a bill are the same thing. Okay? His opinion's worth nothing. He had no authority because uh, neither statutory authority nor common law authority, yet the judge ignored all the evidence of law we put before them and preferred, you know, to accept the opinion of the barrister. That's the way it is. And then basically it goes on, agents of the state are responsible to a court of justice for the lawfulness of what they do and that the, that the court is the only judge. It's not up to parliament or government to decide what is lawful. The purpose of the courts are to be independent to determine and make sure that everybody is acting lawfully. So those are the three grounds on which the summons are void. So the summons is void, or purported summons is hence void. The court has no subject matter jurisdiction. There is no complaint before the court. Okay. Um, 
and therefore the court cannot proceed to trial until a proper complaint is made before a justice and summons served allow proper time to prepare a reply to the complaint. So basically we can challenge and anybody can challenge a summons prior to the any evidence being given before the magistrates. As a result of that, okay, uh, what you've got is the pur purported summons breaches the will of Parliament enacted as follows. Parliament has the Do Documentary Evidence Act 1868, which is current. By falsely claiming to be a court-issued summons creates a valuable security by granting a reliability order. That's It's in breach of the Local Government Act 1888, 78C. Okay, the council cannot perform any judicial business or otherwise act as a justice or a justice of the peace. And there is no evidence uh, on the purported summons showing it was issued by a justice of the peace, but in sh instead shows uh, it was prepared by the council. The Forgery Act 13, 1913, falsely claiming to be a court issued summons intended to create a valuable security by granting of a liability order. Theft Act 17, 1968, false accounting and blackmail by making unwarranted demands with menace by granting of a liability order. Forgery and Counterfeit Act 1981, Section 1, inducing the public to believe the purported summons is a court document. And Section 3, inducing the public to act against their own interest. Protection of Harassment Act, 97. Uh, being, if continued, is likely to cause fear, alarm and distress. Criminal offence. And now that they're with the knowledge of this, that negates their defence of uh, um, uh, investigating a crime. In breach of the Fraud Act, sections 2, 3 and 7. So this here is basically the magistrates have to deal with the summons before they can proceed with anything. Um, this is followed then by a detailed chronology, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> and the analysis shows that it upholds the constitutional principles of the rule of law, separation of powers, Bill of Rights 1688, Coronation Oath Act 1688, Parliament, Crown and Parliament Recognition Act 1688, Act of Settlement 1700, Section 4, all whose substance is affirmed by Parliament, in the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. Okay? Section 1 affirms the constitutional principle of the rule of law as the Act does not adversely affect the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law and the Chancellor's existing constitutional role in relation to that principle. And bound by the rule of uh, law, the Lord Chancellor is duty bound to uphold the constitutional principles of the separation of powers by ensuring neither government or HMCTS uh, exceed their lawful authority in section 109, which defines a judicial officer to mean an officer of the senior judge listed in Schedule 14, all which are bound by the judicial oaths in section 3, guarantees judicial independence. Subsection 1, the Lord Chancellor, other ministers of the Crown, and all with responsibility for matters relating to the judicial or otherwise the administration of justice must uphold the continued independence of the judiciary. Okay? The council tax admin and enforcement regulations are in breach of this because they are telling the judiciary that if the uh, council can evidence A, B, C, D, E, you must make a liability order and judiciary, this is not enforceable by you. We're going to bypass the courts and directly enforce it. Next, the Lord Chancellor and other ministers of the Crown must not seek to influence particular judicial decisions uh, through any special access to the judiciary. What is secondary legislation, if not exactly that? Uh, six, the Lord Chancellor must have regard to the need to defend that independence 
the need for the judiciary to have the support necessary to em enable them to fulfill their functions. Okay, so the chronology we'll go through now <clears throat> uh, so that you can see how has the law developed over time and how has Parliament interfered uh, and was that interference for the good or the bad? Uh, and uh, you can start to see how we have two routes of remedy. One through the through Parliament, who under the Bill of Rights, Article 13, have to go and amend, strengthen or preserve the law to provide us redress for our grievances. So the function of your MP is you have a problem, you go to your MP, you tell them what your problem is, and they have a duty under Article 13 to go to Parliament and do all reasonable uh, efforts to get remedy for your problem as a constituent. Okay, they're not there to represent you and tell you what to do. Their job is clearly expressed in the Bill of Rights, Article 13, to be one of your routes to get remedy. And your second route is through the courts. They are not there to dictate party politics or whoever pays them the most money to make acts in somebody or individual's benefit. So the chronology, basically in Reg versus Hugh in 1879, uh, it comes up with uh, the common law from before that, and that is that liberty cannot be deprived by a warrant without laying information under oath. Uh, so it does not mean that it must be a written information. It says an uh, uh, information can be verbal or written. Now, what Hugh did was expanded that by saying appearance of the defendant or respondent cures defect okay that's called in-person jurisdiction of a summons or warrant by any means so if you whichever way you get brought in before the justices your appearance cures defect why because it's equity you are being brought before justices okay uh, how you brought is irrelevant if there is valid information or complaint. Okay, so before justices who have authority to resolve the dispute, i.e. subject matter jurisdiction, where the sworn information is verb in writing or verbal. And then it makes exceptions to the rule. Fraud vitiates all i.e. if there is material perjury in information under oath, the summons is void. And if there are any statutory bars of procedure. <clears throat> now, the statutory bars of procedure are where Parliament lays down specific procedures and those must be adhered to, i.e. filling in the detail. Um, so, for instance, for certain... Uh, offences, uh, they'll detail the steps and in others they won't and the, co uh, the general common law will be, uh, will prevail. And also what it says is the trial cannot proceed and must be adjourned if it breaches the, the uh, right to a fair trial to answer the information. So by presenting all of this, they have to deal with this first before they can proceed to trial. And even if they choose to proceed to trial, you only need to discuss this and say, sorry, I'm only here to resolve this issue. Once we've resolved this issue, then if there's any other matters that I need to consider and I haven't got the answers with me, uh, then... I will require an adjournment, i.e. they can't railroad you straight into trial if the summons is unlawful. You need to consent to that. Okay, then in uh, 1890, Dixon also found 
basically the common law right to challenge jurisdiction before trial. So it's reaffirming all of this. And it expands on Hugh in that if there are statutory time limits. So, for instance, many things can't be brought into the magistrate's court if the offence was occurred more than six months ago. So then we jump forward to uh, 1949. Section 15 of the Justice's Peace Act authorised the delegation of judicial functions. That was fully repealed uh, by the Statute Law Repeal Act 2013. In detail, Section 15 was actually repealed by 1980, and that was basically through the Magistrates Court Act. So all authorised delegation of judicial function was gone already by 1980 Magistrates Court Act. Now, three years later was the Magistrates Court Act of 1952, and that they went back to the original position that only JPs can issue a summons, and that act was repealed for the in the Magistrates Court Act 1980. So basically, from here to here, there was statutory authority to delegate judicial functions. Then, Section 5 of the Justice Peace Act 1968... Mark, Mark can I go yeah. back to that? Yeah. <clears throat> so shouldn't you be re rephrasing that? Um, that that so where is it? It's 1952. Only so it's not repealed. It's confirmed. Uh, basically, if we go back to the beginning, is uh, it okay? So here. From 1949 to 52, it was an experiment. That's the best you can say with it. Okay. And then again, from 68 to 79, it was an experiment. But then going back to the phrasing of that sentence. Yeah, let's just go. Uh, uh, let me just get back to it. Yeah. Okay, so section 1 and 43 of the Magistrate Court Act 1952, only JPs can issue summons. Yeah, and then you put fully repealed by Mag uh, Magistrate Court Act 1980, but actually it's fully confirmed by Magistrate Court Act 1980. Uh, well, no, no, no. This act was repealed by that one, and so this stood until 1980. It was uh, um, only JP. Okay, okay, so okay, could... okay. I've got it. Okay, yeah. It's just the However, section. However, in between. Yeah was the 1968 Justice of the Peace Act, uh, which authorised the Justice Court Rules, uh, Clark Rules 1970, uh, for the issuance of a summons. Okay. Um, next thing we have is uh, the Brentford case, which affirms that you'd, uh, uh, signatures don't have to be in wet ink, they can be rubber stamped, but only with authority from the justices. <clears throat> then uh, Schedule 3 of the Justice Peaks Act 79 removed the delega uh, delegation of uh, judicial decisions, and that itself was fully repealed, the whole act, uh, by 2003. So that's why from 1968, where it was allowed it, it stopped again in 79. And in the Magistrates Court Act 1980, again, it put in uh, only justices of the peace. And Section 144 does not expressly alter the common law to allow judicial decisions to be delegated. Well, it does not even... Uh, express that it can uh, as an act that does not authorize authorize delegation of judicial authority nor expressly alter the common law to allow judicial decisions to be delegated and hence cannot be construed to allow for the same now the important thing about this expressly alter the common law Okay, 
if Parliament uh, is altering the common law, they must say so. Uh, because it, the common law cannot be impliedly repealed. Okay? <clears throat> Equally, the constitutional statutes cannot be impliedly repealed. Uh, and that there is to make sure that uh, judicial scrutiny is properly applied to things which make fundamental change. Next one was uh, Gateshead Justice is in 1981, and that there affirms you cannot uh, delegate judicial authority, thereby reaffirming Magistrates Court Act 1980 is lawful i.e. justices must authorize a summons. And then here things go a bit haywire. Okay, in this House of Lords decision, there's an error of fact. That error of fact is that the House of Lords accepted a circular from the Council of Society of Justices dated 1975 is valid authority to delegate the judicial function to issue a summons. So they stepped back and ignored all of what happened from 1975 being the repeal of that authority in 79 and 80. They've ignored that. And they've just said, ah, no, we found some, you know, this, you know, uh, <clears throat> a memo saying, ah, it's all right, let the justices do it. And that there's in effect what's happening now again as we've seen with Sean. Um, so then in 97, there was another Justice of Peace Act that also does not uh, authorize delegation of judicial decisions. That was itself repealed by the Courts Act uh, 2003. Now the Justice's Clark Rules 99 claim authority from the Magistrates Court Act Section 144 that does not authorize delegation of uh, um, judicial function. I need to put the revokes up, revoked up there so that it's clear what it pertains to. I need to go through all of those. So basically the, uh, the 99 rules, no delegation, the Courts Act 2003, that reaffirms at 47.1 that only Justice of the Peace can issue a summons and thereby updated sections 51 and 51 of the Magistrates Court Act to what it still is today. This is what it says today in the Magistrates Court Act. Made to a Justice of the Peace, the Justice of the Peace may issue the summons. Okay, so this is primary legislation. So secondary legislation cannot undermine primary legislation. The Justice's Clark Rules 2005 then claim authority from the Magistrates Court Act Section 144, okay, uh, and that has no authority to delegate judicial functions. The Courts Act, Section 28, and this is actually written in the Clark Rules, that there only authorizes the giving of legal advice to justices of the peace. Nothing to do with delegating authority. These guys really pull this stuff just out of wherever they want, and nobody checks it. They just make assumptions and presumptions. Next, then, is the Courts and Tribunal Enforcement Act 2007. Now, basically, Section 41 constrains things in exactly the way uh, that uh, the Courts Act 2003 does, but it does not apply to courts and uh, magistrates' courts because it only applies to first-tier upper employment and the employment appeal tribunals, i.e. the Tribunal and Courts and Enforcement Act has got nothing to do with magistrates' courts. However, uh, this we need to check how does this all tie in 
with the um, uh, National Business Centre and the tribunals for speeding tickets or whatever, stuff like that. And equally, it does not authorise the delegation of judicial function, which is expressly excluded at 40, section 40, subsection 3. That says, the Lord Chancellor may not enter into contracts for the provision of staff to discharge functions which involve making judicial decisions or exercising any judicial discretion. Okay? So, because these here are about ensuring appropriate services are provided for an efficient and effective system to support the business of, okay, the magistrate's court is the Courts Act. This one here is first here in the tribunal side. It is nothing to do with delegating authority of judicial decisions. In fact, it expressly excludes anything to do with that. Okay, the next one is the Banfield case, which they all quote, but basically that simply continues the error from the House of Lords case in 1982, relying upon a circular. Now, uh, there's absolutely no way until the 2018 that there could have even been any doubt about the authorization of the delegation of um, judicial decision making. Now, the Tribunal and Courts Act 2018, Staff Act, inserted Part 6A of the Court Act, and that only came into effect in 2020. Okay? So it goes through then, uh, Section 67A defines what a judicial officer holder office holder is okay and that takes you to the constitutional reform act 2005 that takes you to schedule 14 and that you won't find the word authorized person in there therefore 67a subsection 1 does not authorize delegation of judicial functions the relevant judicial function as one which entitles a person to exercise functions of a court, of such a court. Okay, that's what a relevant judicial function is. So back to the section 148 of the Magistrate Court Act, which defines a magistrate's court as any justice or justice of the peace acting under an enactment or by virtue of the commission, blah, blah, blah. So, entitles a person to exercise functions of such a court. So, you can, uh, the court requires a justice or justices. Without a justice or justices, you cannot have a court. So, that uh, doesn't work either. Section 51 also was reaffirmed in 2003, uh, 2003 uh, and it remained unaltered by Parliament. If Parliament had intended with this to delegate authority, they would have said so. They did not say so. Okay? And, and Section 11, uh, 144 was also updated, but it's impossible to construe that it even had the intent or was about delegation of judicial function. Because it, section 144 is only to make rules for regulating and prescribing procedure and practice. Okay. Now, here you can see uh, uh, how you would apply the rule uh, expressio, exclusio, inclusio, or whatever. It uses the words for regulating and prescribing procedure and practice. Therefore, it excludes everything else, i.e. it can only do this. And that does not include delegating judicial authority. Okay. Then uh, it goes to 67A1A, and that there 
uh, constrains the Lord Chancellor to his general duties as per section one, which is to ensure that appropriate services are provided for an efficient and effective system to support the business of the magistrate's court. Nothing to authorize delegating the judicial decision. Uh, 67B1, again, A, further constrains to delegate judicial functions to people appointed by Section 2.1, which constrains appointments of officers by the Lord Chancellor's general duties, where 67B2, subsection 5, expressly excludes appointments which authorise delegation of the judicial function. The Lord Chancellor may not enter into contracts for the provision of officers and staff to discharge functions which involve making judicial decisions or exercising any judicial discretion. So accordingly, no person appointed by the Lord Chancellor can be delegated authority by the Lord Chief Justice to delegate any judicial decision. Now here in 67C, it implies that judicial functions or it could be construed that judicial functions can be delegated without restriction by the Lord Chief Justice. However, Section 67A, which we've just gone through, and 67B, okay, they make it clear that the judicial function cannot be delegated to non-judicial officers. And therefore, 67C correctly and uh, interpreted can only mean that the Lord Chancellor can delegate different judge and uh, sorry the Lord Chief Justice can make rules as to which judicial office holder can make what judicial decisions okay uh, secondly the rules are secondary legislation they cannot undermine any primary legislation i.e sections 1 and 51 of the magistrates court act are clear and expressed no uh, summons can be issued by anyone unless they are a justice of the peace and um, and again judicial functions cannot be delegated and and should parliament even contemplate del uh, changing that they must expressly state that they are changing the common law. They cannot impliedly do that. And then that takes us to the Magistrates Court Functions Rules 2020, which is what they are relying on. That claims authority from Magistrates Court Act 1980, Section 144, which we've been through, does not confer any authority to delegate judicial decisions to non-judicial officers and we've been through the Courts Act, which again does not authorise judicial decisions to be authorised, uh, de delegated to non-judicial officers. Therefore, as the summons is not authorised by Justice of the Peace and the Magistrates Court and Council Tax Admin Enforcement Regulations, it is void and, have, uh, and of no legal effect, and therefore the complaint is, uh, no complaint is before the court and the court cannot proceed to trial. Okay, so this is the notice that uh, I've just uh, put up this evening. And uh, hopefully people have got a reasonable understanding of the contents of it and, uh, and um, what it's about. Now, this goes way beyond just the, uh, the uh, summons for council tax. This applies to absolutely every single summons issued by uh, a court. All right. Uh, so uh, this is one of the things which is uh, we'll be arguing or we have argued. And uh, Darren's Section 111 has been refused. We've got a certificate of refusal and uh, they rely on in particular also with the summons which is exactly what we've been talking about today uh, but that they'll all be moving into the high court so has anybody got any questions on that
or anything uh no you're all right Look Uh, at Brian can you Jones. send is it possible you can send um, the you know the thing that you sent the 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 thing um, that I sent what thing um what you were showing before the notice what you showing before yeah the notice can you send send that by email so I can and have a look no at it. it's on the website you can go to the website it's on the website i've put it up on the uh, chat groups where to get it no i can't send it by email uh the, you know um we'll put in a link uh to the document uh with this video yeah calvin to do with summons okay uh is it both civil and criminal this is for uh civil and uh yeah criminal yeah yeah and criminal they still uh, criminal they need the um uh, the justice's name justice's name yeah okay cool and my when my m461 which is still awaiting a date <clears throat> um should i submit this as new information found Um, I mean, just see how you can slip it in, Joe. Okay, because the thing is, uh, if you're changing, you know, they'll get asked you about changing the evidence and stuff like Well, that. it, well, it, well, it isn't changing the evidence. It's, it's this, this, I would suggest using your skeleton argument, because yeah. this is the detail to what you've got, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Wendy. Sorry, Does that I've answer your did... question earlier this morning? About just using council tax? No, about the summons. You asked uh, it. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, on the... Now, what was your thing? Yeah, on the uh, thing you just put up uh, on the group, it said about um, you got to submit it as soon as you get your summons. What if you had your summons in a week or two? Can you still it submit doesn't matter. it? Submit it before you walk into that court, because by submitting it before you walk into that court, the court has no jurisdiction. It has to deal first with the lawfulness of the summons. Once that's established, then uh, it can proceed. And at best, it can proceed to them laying their complaint to the, to the magistrates who can authorize a summons which needs serving on you to a future date. Thank you. And you know, uh, you, you said, so if I enter that court, I can just say, right, this has, this deals to deal with first before we can proceed with this trial. Correct. The summons, the lawfulness of the summons needs to be um, uh, dealt with. And Basically, in criminal matters, if it's not been signed by a justice and it's more than six months or issued by a justice and it's more than six months, most criminal charges are void. Cool. Okay. That sounds good to me. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Dave? May I just interject very quickly, Sorry, Mark, yeah. uh, to oh, Ross? Please. Is Ross still here? I think yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he's yeah. yeah I'm okay. still here. Ross, the document I've given you the link to it, and yes, you can email the court with it. Oh, sorry, I thought it was. Can you can I email you the document? Sorry, Ross, I misunderstood. Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Um, Hi there. Hi there. You, you were talking about the Documentary Evidence Act. I'd just ask you to double check that that's still current legislation. I remember having an argument with um, our friend um, about that some while back, and I was corrected by them um, when they said it was no longer on the statute books. I never looked it up, so okay. you might want to double. Evidence Act. Do you remember off the top of your head what is 1868. Yeah, it's about 18. If we've got it right, if we haven't got it right, then we need to delete 
that hang on. I remember pre I remember using it previously um quite copiously but um then I got pulled up on it so I I actually um just amended it and just took it out all right so it says currently no known outstanding defects let's open the whole thing to see if anything is uh left Mark, do you want to stop recording or carry on? I uh, will just quickly finish this one. So, uh, no. Yeah, it's not being repealed. It's there. Uh, okay, fair, fair enough. Publishment, punishments of forgery, definition of terms, act to be cumulative, the schedule. So, no, it's whoever told you that is wrong. It's not being repealed. It's been amended, obviously, a few times, and you can see that from the top here. There have been loads of amendment to it. And if something's repealed, it'll actually tell you uh, at the top. Um, so what's repealed? So let's look at the General Rights Act again so that people can see. Oops. General Rights Act 1967. Whoops, 1067, that doesn't exist. Oh, copy. Oh, paste. Nineteen. Okay, let's see what that's got. I thought that was repeated. It's not going to find the, the year. If you put it the year in the title. Oh, it has. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, this is only available in its current thing. Okay, so... We're going to, it's actually been repealed as far as I know. Uh, but it doesn't tell you that. But basically, you'll see, oh, hang on, okay, let's have a look at the Justices of the Peace Act 1949. Okay, it's repealed. Okay, it tells you when an act is repealed. And when you open the act, again, it tells you it's repealed. So where acts are repealed, it very clearly tells you that. Okay, Dave? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you for that. I was okay. told a wrong thing, obviously. Yeah. Are I mean, you sure, 98, that it wasn't the actual paragraph that you were that you were citing? Because, of course, exactly. just, you know, every time you have to then go... To the note for that so they could have said that the actual section that you were quoting from in the act had been repealed yeah yeah that always could be make sure that you've got yeah. the latest version yeah yeah since 1886 okay and again that there shows you okay uh you know things are if they're there, they are current and relevant and valid. Okay. Right. Last question. And then if we stop recording, Brian. Ross? Do you have the uh, the names of... I think you said your last time, last week, that you're going to... Are you Has this to question got anything to do with what we've been talking about, the summons notice or something different? Oh yeah, so according to the summons notice, um, yeah. if you if you said that after six months, you were talking about six months, and then I think you said um, they can't uh, process. Is it they can't like it's not illegal? If information has not explain? been laid before a justice of the peace within six months, uh, it will tell you on yeah. the offences whether there's a statute of limitations. Many offences are time barred with six months but specific ones you'll have to check i can't tell you off the top of my head uh, which ones are or aren't 